What's up, guys? This is David, a.k.a. Reverse Long, and today I got Jeff Zen- 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 Zenaniri on the podcast. You got it, man. There we go. There we go. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so he is a former prop trader turned hedge fund manager for – he's been in the business for, like, 20 years. And so, like, I just uh, was interested to see, um, you know, his his background and how he developed over the years because he has a wealth of knowledge. And I'm always looking to learn from people that have more experience than me and to have – a lot of insights so decided to reach out to jeff and bring him on the podcast and uh here he is so what's up jeff how's it going excellent how you doing dave exciting day in the market we're finally getting a little bit of action huh yeah you know so so uh it's it's not summer anymore right because it's like the summer low so it's kind of like starting to heat up a little bit so so from your experience right there so in, in the, do you take summers off a lot of times or Oh my gosh. So I've got a wife and I've got three kids and we go up to New York, which is where I'm originally from. I'm I'm in Miami now. So I still trade my own money. I have uh, a trading uh, options service where I provide trade, you know, trading education and, and different trades and different strategies that I introduce my, my subscribers to. And so I still do that while like, you know, traversing the United States, the East coast going up 95 and uh, I can do that because it's not like, you know, it's not like now where, you know, you, you go away for a few hours and you're like, yeah, I just missed the trade, you know, yeah. right after Labor Day. It's like the big boys come back. The flow comes back. The volume comes back. You get much better action. You get better vol. And we're seeing it almost instantaneously. Yeah. So with that, Jeff, so um, are you going to give a brief background on yourself to the listeners that, uh, you know, they listen to you for the first time? See Absolutely. Your, your so I started I started in the business in the late 90s. I was a sell side institutional trader with Bear Stearns and I moved over to the buy side. I got into prop trading. I worked for a company called Schoenfeld, famous prop trading firm, became a famous hedge fund. Worked then I then I left and went to a uh international stock trading hedge fund and was there for over 10 years and we did out of Fort Lauderdale, I moved back to Florida from New York City to do that. And I worked with those guys for 10 years and we were trading, you know, stocks, futures, FX, doing arbitrage all over, all over the planet. So uh, then after that, traded for various prop firms, now trade my own money. And like I said, have my own stock trading research business. Wow. So when you say sell, <laughs> sell side, is that... Yeah. um? Like short selling, or is it like analyst uh, reports or something? No, or... sell side. Sell side is like you know, like your bank, like your Goldman Sachs's of the world. Lehm, you know, <laughs> the old school Lehman Brothers, uh, Morgan Stanley, J.P. Morgan. So when people say sell side, they're referring to the brokers that are calling and saying, you know, can I be your broker? Can you want to do this trade? We've got fifty thousand shares of Apple to go. It used to be like in the day, a lot of transactions had to be done like that. So that expression comes from the old school sell side of the bankers, you know, trading for the big banks and the buy side are trading at funds, uh, portfolio managers. They manage money. They don't broker trades. Gotcha. And you mentioned uh, you were with Bear Stearns. So is that like when they so vaguely, I know, like they collapse, right? Or something I was like gone that. way before that. I was gone way before that. But you're right. They did collapse. They collapsed in the financial crisis. But for a while. Uh, Bear was a formidable trading house on the street and it was built up, you know, nowadays, like you have to go to like Harvard or you have to go to UPenn to get into one of those, fan, you know, fancy trading programs. But back in the day, Bear used to hire guys like me that went to a state university or from, you know, from the city, those kind of guys that have a strong work ethic, you know, call them street fighters. So maybe a little bit less pedigreed, like Ivy League school kids and more kind of like street smart people that were into trading like stock, like heavily into trading stocks and, and short-term strategies. So, so with that, so, so what, what time frame was this around what year? 90, uh, uh 98, 99. Dot com bubble. Dot com. I, I was born in the dot com oh, and the collapse man. of it. So it it's, you know, I tell every new trader that starts whatever market you start in is going to be like, it's almost like your first dating experience. It's going to color your psychology on the rest of your, of your experience in trading. Now understand, like I've traded financial crisis. I've traded uh, BP oil spill, Fukushima in Japan, like COVID, all these things, but everything I always draw back to like, 
Well, I remember Cisco went from $30 to $300, then back down to $10. You know what I'm saying? So that's always like tattooed on my brain, that whole era. And it was wild. It was nuts. So Cisco, yeah, because like no one really understands. I, I hear, you know, I've interviewed some people, uh, a, a couple of hedge fund managers. They vaguely broke it down to me, 99. But when I read like um some stuff or what happened, like Linux went from like, a I don't know, a couple bucks, like to 300. I can't believe this. This is like, like the way it traded uh, in 2021. A, but like we it's had an like, IPO. No, we had like, so, so when, you know, when you're at a sell side shop like Bear, we had investment bankers too. So we did IPOs. And so I would have to go sit there in the morning, you know, I was in my early twenties. And uh, they'd be like presenting, they'd be presenting their pitch for their company. And then we have to go out to the world and, you know, try to get that book filled, try to get IOIs, try to get people that want to own the stock that are, that are committed to going to hold the stock for six months, be locked up in the IPO. And a lot of times I'd be looking at the guy that was talking to me like, this guy's full of shit. What's he talking about? And so we had one stock that was called the globe.com. And on the first day, the stock went up 350%. In the first day, it was the top performing IPO, I think, of the dot com era. Um, and and then and, like, and it's not like an actual business. It was like a yeah, fake yeah. business, kind of the way like everybody's like AI now, and yeah, they're like, yeah. you know, like Publix in Florida is like we have AI. It's like okay, cool, whatever, you know. But there's like three real AI companies, like real real AI companies. Same thing was the case with the internet, right? So everybody was just like, we're dot com now. So value us like dot com and for a little while it worked until it didn't yeah so were people like buying on e-trade or something because the when i think of the dot com yeah. boom this is like dial up, e dial up internet yeah so it was aol it was dial up internet but when you were trade like professional trade so really the only people that were trading trading were pros or semi-pros like i didn't know a lot of people that were like you know nowadays i have thousands of customers that subscribe to trade the doctors the plumbing businesses, the executives, whatever. Everybody trades now, right? Everybody has access to 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 all kinds of algorithms, level two, everything. All the information that used to be like, you had to be like a pro, you can get now. So started changing a little bit in late 90s. You started seeing people like retail traders, recreational trading. And then what you started having is you started having like these uh these these semi-pro proprietary trading firms where you had to post like 25 grand 50 grand and they would leverage it. See, back in the good old days before that we had the financial crisis, you could post like $20,000 and trade $500,000. Wow. Yeah. So a lot of people weren't trading options during that era because they were just, you get so much leverage from brokers that everybody would just day trade stocks and stocks were moving so much that it was just like, why even look at options? You know what I'm saying? So that's changed, obviously. So you went through the dot com era, then the, the boom and bust, and then <laughs> two thousand eight, the financial crisis, and yeah. then uh, I guess you know later on you see in stocks. Uh, when I started, there was the weed mania, Bitcoin, uh, two thousand seventeen ish, and then you get yeah. the whole pandemic craze, and then following that, the meme stocks. So from your experience, is it safe to say? Because I saw a reputable trader that runs a uh, hedge fund. He mentioned, man, you just got to be be positioned with the knowledge and experience. So that every five to 10 years, you're, you know, something big happens. Is that about right? Like something like that? That's 100 percent right. So you should always have a little bit of like insurance, like that everything is going to go bad, you know, and you get paid a lot on your insurance. Like, for example, like uh, Black Swan Theory, you know, this guy, Talib, he writes this book yeah. that like they're always mispricing risks. Black Swans happen a lot more than people think they do. Bad things happen consistently, but as human beings, psychologically, we're like conditioned to think they never happen. So the marketplace is always underpricing risk in a way. And so you can buy protection for relatively cheap, particularly in moment, like times where everything's amazing in the economy and the market's making all time highs. Nobody wants insurance at that point because it's a losing proposition, but that's where you can get like hundred, you know, fifty baggers, hundred baggers on puts, uh, you know, quickly, quickly. I mean, right now we're looking at a VIX that's trading four. I mean, trading fourteen, fourteen ish, mid teens, and you know, they're selling. There's bad selling in some names. There's there's you know breakdowns in stocks. You'll see stocks that are 
that are like 15, 20% off their highs in terms of like NASDAQ stocks, et cetera. And uh, the market's not doing much underneath the surface. Another, another stock will rise or another sector will rise. So it'll, it'll neutralize the effect. But at some point, things crack in my experience. Gotcha. And um, when did, from your experience, when did those become like the most uh, profit, you know, the be the best way to use those? I can imagine like the financial crisis, 2008, something like that would be um, beneficial or. I loved it. So here was what I always tell people. The best part about, and this is going to sound like a van, like my wife's always joking. She's like, you're like a vampire, like this bad stuff. Like you're so bit, you know, like I'm, a, you know, all like short-term traders are a little bit wired to be a little like extra bearish. Right. So my wife is like, you're just sitting around waiting for like bad things. I'm like, no, not at all. But the best part of when you have like crisis or you have like a financial crisis or you have any kind of a disarray in the markets is during that period, you can make a lot of money really quick. There's an 80 20 rule. You make 80% of your money and 20% of the time. So you can decrease your size of trading and like still make triple or quadruple what you're used to making in a week and a month, you know? Um, with much less risk, uh, like in terms of your position sizing. But the best part is if you're making a little bit of money, like let's say you're not like a pro's pro and you don't clean up in those periods of time. If you're just making a little bit and you're surviving, the 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 upswing that usually happens after those things is the easiest thing ever to make money in because nobody's trading. Everybody got blasted out. Everybody got buried. The volume's low. Participation is light. So you get a lot of good deals just by still being in the market, still being in the game, basically. Wow. So that that reminds me of like what happened in March 2020. Was it March? I believe that when the market just uh, the market halted down like three or two, two or three times. Halt, halt, halt. The whole entire market. I've never seen anything Remember like that? that. And then um, I know someone that's very wealthy said he he was buying at that time. And I was like, wow, I, I was a a newer, relatively newer trader. I was like, man, how do you buy when the when the world's like ending like that? <laughs> you know, so yeah, that's another part of like psychology too and just being prepared. So yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm a, I, I'm a contrarian, so I'm always fading moves. I like to trade the close. I like to trade as, like we had to schedule this after the market because I like to trade. Like I concentrate really hard on the last hour of the market because I think there's a lot of opportunities that open up where people throw stocks out of bed or they, they overstretch them and you can fade, you can fade moves into the next day pretty consistently. And so I love it when you're having like, you know, the world's ending, the stock market's down five days in a row, uh, disease is bad, everything's bad, Monday's going to be the end of the world. Those are the best days. Those are the days you make the most money. The close of those days, those Fridays, those weeks, those historic weeks or like 80% of the time that next the following week, by the end of the week, you'll be higher than the beginning of the sell-off that week. Not, not only will you start making money right away the following week, but by the end of the week, many times, you've taken back the whole sell-off. So I love those situations. They don't happen a lot, but when, when, when you trade as long as I have and you've seen all these different, um, what a, different flavors, but the same movie, you know what I'm saying? Like the plots, always the same there's different characters there's different themes but it always ends the same way you just you just figure that out and so i'm very like statistically oriented because of my hedge fund days i i i trade a lot off numbers less off charts i have data series like excel spreadsheets etc that tell me if a move is extraordinary if it's abnormal if it's incredibly unlikely and those sort of things so if you have the kind of moves that just like never happen you know, barring some massive news story that's changed the entire world completely, um, you you tend to make money in those spots. Gotcha. And um, are there any examples of like your your favorite trades of, of something like that? From your experience, I'm, it's it's hard it's hard to pin down. It's hard to pin down a few, but I think British Petroleum they had an oil spill. Uh, in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. And, you know, at the time they were the largest, you know, before it happened, they were the largest oil company in the world. They went from being the largest oil company in the world to almost out of business. And so people were estimating that they were going to have to pay out like $200 billion in, in, in fines and, 
and lawsuit damages, you know, to the entire Gulf coast. Right. But having been, you know, alive and through like these arbitrations that go into the government, they always settle for much, much less. And so BP was a situation where you could buy, you could buy as much BP as you wanted. And the stock went straight up the banks during the Lehman crisis, uh, were another situation where like bank of America was a $2 stock bank of America. Yeah. And nobody wanted to own that stock. Nobody wanted to own the bonds. They didn't want to own the preferred stocks. The preferred shares were trading with like a 14, 15% dividend for a while, for a long time. So those were, those were, those were some of the best trades I've ever done. Some of the most memorable trades, but they don't happen. They don't happen. Like I don't expect any of those kind of trades in the next six to 12 months here. Not even yeah. close. So what do you what do you look for these days? Well, these days I'm looking at these days I'm looking at false breakouts. I think that the market's like shot its shot in the it, you know macro wise, like the broader market for the time being. I feel like we're kind of topping out a little bit. So you have a lot of you have a lot of stocks that are uh, trying to make new highs, then they break down and then they rip back. So you're getting a lot of these kind of moves right? You're not getting this. You're not getting that. So I'm looking for a lot of mean reversion, if that makes any sense. And so I'm measuring the mean reversion when, when we're at the top end uh, of moves to short and we're at the bottom end of those moves to start buying. I'm not a, a perma bull or a perma bear. I like to say I fight with both hands. So I'm agnostic as to whether I'm shorting or, or going long. doesn't matter to me because I'm contrarian anyways. I'm fading the market. Um, so that's what I'm looking at right now, you know, broadly speaking. So by fading the market, you're are you taking puts or are you shorting stocks? I'm trading options now, mainly. Trading yeah, options. Puts. Okay. I'm, I'm buying puts, yeah. And throughout your career, like how have you been able like to adapt for so long? You know what I mean? Just like to changing psychology or just learning, just constantly learning and just adapting and, and like you using Humility, macro. Man. You have to be humble, dude. You have to be humble. You have to understand that none of us know anything, right? And it's, all, you know, I've been doing this a long time, but that doesn't mean I can't learn from someone like you. And I, I learned from guys your age, guys with your experience stuff all the time. Like I got into crypto for a while. Uh, I invest in it. I traded it for a little while, but I stay open-minded, you know, because the thing is nothing stays like static. Strategies don't stay static. Markets don't stay static. So if you're like static in your mind and you think that, uh, what you've done and what you've made millions or what you've like made a lot of money doing is the only way to do it, then that that's a surefire way to lose all your money because everything changes all the time. And so you have like the number one skill to longevity in this game is adapt is adapting, adapting. And the hardest part and the part that people spend the, the least amount of time is figuring out what kind of market regime we're in, what kind of environment we're in and adapting their strategies to that. They're tr always trying to force their strategy on the market. They're always trying to say, well, you know, I understand that we're having these like unbelievable swings back and forth, but I'm a trend follower. Well, you're going to get busted up trading trends, right? Because every time you have breakouts, they break back down. And every time it looks like it's going to crash, it just floats back up. And so I think, I think the big thing is adapting to what's happening and having a couple of different styles. Do you got do you play sports at all? Uh yeah, yeah, I used to play baseball heavily, yeah, for a long time. Nice. Do you play any yeah. golf? Do you play any golf? Uh, no, 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 no golf. All right. So a little golf term, like little golf trick real quick is like so like the best golfers in the world, they can hit the same shot like three different ways, but they have like a bread and butter way to do it, depending on if it's windy, depending on the circumstances, the external environment, right? And so trading is kind of similar. Like you got to have a volatility strategy. You got to have a trend following strategy. You got to have a crisis strategy and you should, you should spend the most time figuring out uh, what market regime you're in. And then you should, you know, allocate your capital to those strategies the most. That's what gotcha. the biggest funds in the world do. They basically, I don't know if people who are watching this know that, but they have like a bunch of mini me's in there, right? They have a bunch of dudes like me that have our strategy. We have what we do. And then they have like pods, they call them pods. And what happens is when you have a bunch of killer pods, like people that are really good at what they're doing and have a strategy that works in certain environments, the guys that are crushing it in a certain, in, in, you know, in a bull market, those guys are making 
10 times the amount of money that the guys who have like a bearish strategy are losing, for instance, because of just the risk controls and everything. But that's how they manage it. And then they just flow more money into those dudes while it's working. And then when that stops working, they shut the switch off and then they shift the capital towards what's working. And so I think traders don't, don't do that like too easily when they come into this game, especially young guys, young guys that have not had money and have not made money fall in love really fast with what made them money, myself included. I was the same way and they think it's never going to end and they think that's the only way to do it. And the truth is you can do more than you can learn more styles than you think. And, uh, it's, you know, it's, that's my opinion. Anyways, I could be totally wrong. That's so interesting. The way the hedge funds operate. Cause like we, as uh, individual traders, you know, sometimes the greed gets to us and we think we're invisible, invincible or whatever. And, um, uh, that it's just going to keep going like that. Like I know when I get onto a big streak, that's how I think it, then you get humbled. But so check this out. So I interviewed uh, Victor Sparandio, one of the market wizards about a uh, Vic. Yeah, yeah Trader, Trader Vic, Vic man. Yeah. So um, I talked to Trader Vic. Yep. Yeah, he's um he, so he was he was talking about how he used to uh he was um one of the big one of the bear traders for uh J Joe Soros. Is that his name? Jo jo George, George Soros. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. George Soros, he was saying that he's one of the smartest people he've met. He doesn't agree with his politics, but he's one of the smartest. He's like, <laughs> I don't 10, either. <laughs> he's like, yeah, same here. He's like 10 uh, senators and congressmen combined into one. Like he's just a, a IQ is out through the roof. And, um, and George Soros was said at one point that he, he, he was doing so well. He felt like he was like God himself. But anyway, George would, would, uh, Trader Vic was handling the bear side. And then when the bear, when Trader Vic, saw the bear market was over. He returned the funds to George Soros and said, okay. Uh, and then they shut that part down. And then George Soros put more money towards the bulls. So like, he was just managing different pods. I can see like, and just like funneling money to see whichever one is, is doing well at the time. I don't know. It's very interesting, you know? So is that, that's like a form of like trend following or just adding to your winners kind of is like, it's really like, it's really just like re really, really good. Like asset allocation is all it is. And like risk management. And they're so, I mean, the kind of like technology that these guys have to know what like your sharp ratio is, what your VAR is, your value at risk at every moment. When you're mad, like I was in a place like that, managing millions and millions and millions. And they knew every second. And I was, I'd have like futures against stocks and like, I'd have FX risk. I didn't even know about and they knew the risk guys knew and the machine knew and they would tell me and they'd be like, Jeff, you need to go out and cover some British pounds in the market. Cause if this happens, you're going to lose this. And so it's humbling. Um, Cause you think like you're on top of the world when you go on a hot streak. And I know everyone knows this, that listens to you. That's, you know, traded for a while. And this is the thing that we got trained about, you know, the, the, the knee jerk reaction is to think you're the best. Right. And to brag, to brag. And to like walk around, tell your buddies, post it on the internet. And so I teach, I teach my students not to get a big ego in the short term, not to go because you're going to lose your edge uh, very quickly. And what happens is, is that you lose your focus and you become emotional and you stop making the same strategic decisions you were making to get you in that spot where you made a bunch of money. And when that happens, then you could get hit like in fighting, like in, in any fight or anything. If you get cocky, start showboating, then the punch can happen. So we always had a habit of like, you you were like barred from doing what we call the victory lap on the trading floor. So like, I I, I had a crazy story. I was trading the, the, um, the flash crash. Have you heard of the flash crash? When? Yeah. The, that, um, the, it, there's a book on it. I read, I did a re book review on it. It's like that Indian uh, British guy. that, that It was uh, an Indian British guy who got hammered for it, but he wasn't the guy. What really happened was there was a long only mutual fund manager in like Omaha or Nebraska or something. And for some reason, he decided that he needed to hedge his long only fund of billions of dollars with S and P with spoos with S and P futures in like that second. And so instead of like calling up Goldman or, or, you know, like a normal person would do and just be like, how much can I do? Can you work this order for me? I need to get some protection. How long is it going to take? Because they're they're very scientific about it. This dude just like took his finger and hit the sell button on like fifty thousand spoos at the market, 
And so what happened was the S&P future went down 8% in under 15 seconds. And then all of these quants that have like these, like these strategies that are pegged to what the S&P does. So they'll start like shorting stocks to match the S&P 500 started shorting stocks with the same size. While that was happening though, dude, the bids were all fake because this is when spoofing started happening. Yeah. People were putting out fake bids. So there wasn't really orders there. So some stocks went to like two cents, three cents. They had a break, like a ton of orders. I personally was short S&P futures at that moment because I was trading against Asia and I was going to buy Nikkei futures and Hong Kong futures in this thing. So by the end of the day, the market was already down 2%. I'm shorting with the market going down. And by four o'clock, I'm going to be completely flat. I'm going to be delta neutral. I'm going to have as many Nikkei's notional risk as I have short S&P uh, futures. But then all of a sudden, I look at my screen and like what I thought was, you know, my my, my typical day was like a six-figure day. And it was, this was, you know, I'd be up down 150, 200,000. And that was cool. And then I look and I see up 1 million, up one and a half million. And I'm like, and I didn't even have my full position on, you know? I'm like a third of the position happened like in the early afternoon. And I was just like, boom, getting out. I was just like buying it. I was just taking offers because I was short. And fund manager, I didn't go like crazy or anything. The fund manager's like, what's going on? You're really quiet. I'm like, I'm just focusing. I'm just covering this thing. He's like, you're up. Are you up like a million right now on this thing? And I'm like, I am. Yeah. He's like, good job. And I'm like, got lucky. But the moral of the story is when you trade, when you, when you have a system, when you have a strategy, you put yourself in a situation that you can get lucky, but in that spot, it's very important to capture the money, to stay even, even headed, to stay cool and to just land the plane basically. And so like, if you learn and you get that discipline of not being emotional and that's winning and losing, it becomes a lot easier to be like, like professional about it. So at the, in that moment, um, like you were just like, trying to land the plane but you must have been like a big a big excitement right it's a flash crash you're, you're, oh no you're, dude, you're we were joking the... we're joking like for years like this happened i think it was like 2012 or 13 and uh till this day you know the old founder of the fund he'll still text me i'll be like do you, you remember when you had that out of body experience because i joke that like I floated out of my body and was like watching myself trading <laughs> from the sky, like one of those old cartoons. And we joke about it because I was like, I went numb, but I also went into like action mode. Like I couldn't talk about it, but I had to like do, do things. Cause what happens with the human brain a lot, and this is where you can train a trader and you have to train this part of your brain. It's almost like seeing a car accident, right? When you see like a really bad accident or somebody mangled or like something really like traumatizing your brain kind of starts to shut itself down in a way or if you get hit really hard same thing happens and so if you have like a really emotional excitement thing that happens it triggers the same type of reaction in your mind which starts to shut down but if you have a process of like okay i'm going to cover five I'm, you know i had think 100 snps at that point i was like five five i'll do 10 i'll do five until like it was like out you know, um, just little things like getting up, going for a walk, standing, because how often do you just sit there and get stuck in your thing? Like I've been sitting for four hours. I haven't even gotten up. It's important to like trigger your, keep your mind in, in an action oriented, uh, mode, if that makes any sense. It does. So when you said like, okay, so you have, a like a plan in those situations where you're not just getting out full position. Cause like you're excited to just take the money. You're just like five, 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 you know, this is what a rookie would do. This is what a rookie would do. A rookie would do nothing. And this is why a rookie would do nothing because a rookie and he would have missed the whole trade because it came back up. It was a flash. It went back up. Yeah. It was a flash. That's what I'm saying. Yes. Yeah, so how long so, was that for, by the way, that was a few minutes, a few minutes. Okay. I mean, it, it didn't like all the way come all the way back, but it, it, 80% of the move got retracted in the stocks. If I hadn't had that position, like the other guys that were there, they made money too, buying stuff that cheap, but they didn't have as much on and they couldn't, they weren't fast enough to chase it all back up. But here's what a rookie do. A rookie would do yeah. nothing. And here's why a rookie would do nothing. Because a rookie would wait and to squeeze as much of it out as possible and be mat as meticulously careful to try to take off the entire position at the exact low or try to like look at charts Whereas I was just looking at numbers and saying, okay, that's a, 
it's an awesome price. You can have five here. You get still an awesome price. You can have five there. You can have five and just doing, knowing that if I was just fast to act and just doling out of my thing, I would get a nice average close to the low. Maybe not the exact low, but within like a percent and a half of the low was my average, which is more than enough money. It wasn't the peak amount of money that I was up, but that's not important. What's important is to capture it and act. Now, um, what what led you to be prepared for this? Just like, because you can't anticipate, oh, one day the market's going to do a flash crash. I got to be ready for it. So it's like. You, no, you... I was just, I was lucky, dude. I was just doing what I do. I was, you know, I trade pair trades a lot too. I trade towards the close old pair trades for the, for your viewers that don't know are when you're long and short a pair. So you're long one thing and you're short another thing. And you're, you're what they call market neutral. You don't have a lean in the market. You're not bullish. You're not bearish. I'm long. $5,000 of AMD and I'm short $5,000 of Intel. All right. So if Godzilla takes out Tokyo tomorrow and everything goes down 50%, theoretically, I should be around break even because I'm hedged, right? That's a pair. But what I like to do is I like to leg into my pair. I like to lean with the market. You know what I'm saying? So if the market's going down, I want to be short. I want to be buying l l slower than I'm selling. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, it's particularly like in like very directional tapes um, towards the close. So that's why I, that's why that happened for me. Gotcha. So Jeff, so, so just start to wrap it up. Um, yeah. So any, any new stuff you have going on or like, how can the listeners find you? Oh, so I have, I have a, an options trading service where I teach you the basics of the options. I teach you the basics of my favorite strategies, my favorite uh, fade trades that I do overnight. And I have a website that I can share with you that you guys can check out some free videos. I have some courses that I have that you would have to pay for. And of course the trades, but otherwise, uh, you know, I'm around. <laughs> thanks. Well, Jeff, Hey, thanks for coming on the podcast and sharing all that wealth of knowledge, man. Um, yeah, it's been yeah. great. So, and we will stay in touch. Thanks, thanks Dave. Yeah, I thanks. thought, I hope, uh, I hope, uh, that was useful for your listeners and, you know, I got a lot. Absolutely. Of talk yeah, you. it was pretty, it was fun, man. Um, looking forward to another one in the future. I'll see you guys yeah, see you soon. All right. All right. Bye. Thanks, dude.